so much for that introduction, and I'm very excited to be here with everyone today to tell you a little bit about our research. I actually want to start by asking you a question. So, can we find non-zero whole number solutions to the equation a squared plus b squared equals g squared? And hopefully this looks a little bit familiar to you. The diagram here tells us that this is how the sides of the right triangle are related. So I can rephrase my question by asking, can we find right triangles with whole number side lengths? And the answer to this is yes, and here are a couple of examples. In fact, there are infinitely many triangles like this, and so there are infinitely many solutions to this equation with whole numbers. So let me change my question ever so slightly and ask, with the exponent being a 3 instead of a 2? Or maybe I could be even more general and ask for any exponent n, can I find whole number non-zero solutions to this equation, a to the n plus b to the n equals b to the n. Now, I've barely changed it from what we just saw, so you should hope that there are going to be solutions to this thing. Um, this is, in fact, something that Pierre de Fermat was thinking about back in 1637, and he said, no, there shouldn't be any solutions to this <laughs> greater than two. In fact, he went on to say that he had a marvelous proof of this fact, but no record of such a thing was ever found. And mathematicians were baffled for years and years trying to actually verify what from off claims was already proven. And it took almost 360 years and a lot of modern mathematics before it was actually proven by Andrew Wiles in 1995 that, in fact, no, there are no solutions to this equation when n is greater than 2, if I restrict to, to whole numbers. So in the field that I work in, which is algebraic geometry, we're interested in looking at solutions to algebraic equations. Um, but we use geometry to help us. So given some equations, we associate geometric objects. So for example, if I look at the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1, then the set of solutions in the plane to this equation form a circle. And so studying the circle <coughs> helps me better understand the solutions to this equation. And I'll point out that this circle has only four points on it where this, the solutions are whole numbers. And so we're seeing that these whole number solutions are quite rare. And trying to find them is a type of question that even back to ancient Greek mathematicians were, were curious about this kind of thing. Um, the other example I have here is called an elliptic curve. And if I look at the solutions to this equation that are not just whole numbers, but I also allow for fractions, um, then the set of those, those solutions has this really amazing structure. And in fact, these curves end up being used in cryptography and data security. The sort of security of the system relies on this complex structure of those points. Now, if I look at other equations, I can get things like surfaces, two-dimensional objects. If I make the equation more complicated, the corresponding geometric object also gets more complicated. And if I add more variables to the equation, now the geometric object lives in four dimensions. So I can no longer draw pictures for you. So you can imagine these things get very complicated very quickly. Uh, the specific kinds of objects that I study in my research are called moduli spaces. And these are spaces where the points in the objects correspond to something else. So you can think of this like a library card catalog. The cards in the catalog, each card corresponds to a book in the library. Just like the points in the moduli space correspond to something else. Let me give you an example in math. So let's say I want to find the moduli space, which tells me about all lines in the plane through the origin. So, as a reminder, the equation of a line is given by y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope, and b is where the line hits the y-axis. So if I'm looking at lines through the origin, then they all hit at zero, so b is zero. And these lines are just determined by their slope, some number n. And so actually, if I think about the number line, then I see that every point in the number line exactly corresponds to one of these lines through the origin, where I just take the line with that slope. So I sort of have almost captured all of the lines in the origin through the plane just by looking at the number line. But I'm missing one. The vertical line, it has slope undefined, so it doesn't find a base. OK, so if I want a moduli space to sort of correspond to all of these lines through the plane, then I need to somehow unify this number line along with this extra point. And the way to do that is to think of the vertical line as being a line with both sort of positive infinite slope and also negative infinite slope. And so what I want to do is sort of connect positive and negative infinity with this extra point. And we can exactly do that by sort of gluing those things together and getting a circle. Okay, so every point in the circle exactly corresponds to a line in the plane through the origin. Okay, at this point you're probably 
probably wondering, why should we study moduli spaces? And the overall goal in algebraic geometry is to try and understand all of the geometric objects that are defined <coughs> by these algebraic equations. Of course, that's a huge task, and so we try to organize things in a reasonable way, and in dimensions where we can draw pictures, we have sort of, I mean, there's still active research on these objects, but we have a good handle in general on what's happening. And as soon as we move to higher dimensions, all intuition is lost. And the moduli spaces that I study show up in these higher dimensions. And because they have this extra layer of structure, because they correspond to other objects, this allows us to get a sort of better handle on what's happening and gives us glimpses into this uh, sort of higher dimensional world that's otherwise very large and mysterious. Now, the questions that I try to answer about these moduli spaces are pretty difficult to explain, but they're often motivated by the same kinds of questions that Pramal was th thinking about hundreds of years ago. Can we find whole number or even fractional value solutions to the algebraic equations defined in these moduli spaces? And while these moduli spaces actually have applications in physics and string theory, I personally am motivated purely by the desire to try to find 